All right. Well, welcome everybody uh, to this webinar this afternoon organized by ECDPM on integrating the Gender Action Plan 3 into the EU programming process. I'm very happy to see so many of you here with us uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Sophie Desmit and I will be moderating this panel. We have uh, over 50 people, 60 people almost, and uh, some more joining for sure in the next couple of seconds. Um, so from different parts of the world, from the institutions, the member states, but also civil society. So very excited uh, to see this, uh, this participation and uh, looking forward to the discussions today. So um, this event is um, based on recent research conducted by my colleagues, uh, Chloe Thieven, uh, Mariella Di Giomo and Lidet Tades on the integration of the EU's third uh, gender action plan into the ongoing uh, EU programming process. And um, we all know that the GAP3 has been able to build on some of the successes of the previous two uh, gender action plans, but has also tried to address uh, some of its uh, shortcomings. In particular, however, the adoption of um, the new principle of the GAP3 uh, stand out as a particularly interesting and um, uh, promising innovation, um, notably the ambition to address intersectionality and to adopt a transformative approach. And um, in addition, the widening of the thematic focus of the GAP3 has also been widely welcomed, as well as its timing uh, of its publication that coincided with the adoption of the programming of the almost 80 billion uh, neighborhood development and international cooperation instruments, Global Europe or INDICI, uh, as you as you may call it, and let's use perhaps INDICI for, for this afternoon. And so as the EU delegations are now working towards finalizing their programming for the next budgetary cycle, um, our research or the research by my colleagues aimed to understand how the GAP3 is being effectively implemented in the partner countries and also what role the member states can play in the implementation of, of the GAP3. Um, my colleagues began this work with the paper that I mentioned earlier that forms the basis for the discussion here today. And at ECDPM, we will continue this work, of course, in the coming months but with a particular focus also on the implementation of the new principles of the GAP3, inter intersectionality, transformative approach, and what it means uh, for the integration with the Women, Peace and Security agenda with uh, the GAP3. So looking ahead at the implementation of all these plans, the GAP3, we are very happy to welcome our speakers here today, and um, they will talk about how EU delegations are implementing the GAP3 also the role of EU member states. And uh, I will turn to them in a few moments. Before doing this, I'd like to say, of course, that after the panel discussion, we'll have a Q&A session. Um, we'd very much welcome to, if you can identify yourself before posing a question, if you feel comfortable, also turn on your camera. Um, we will be monitoring the chat, of course, as well. And we can also read out your question if, if you prefer that or if, if your connection, for example, uh, only allows to participate through the chat. Um, okay, without further ado, I'd like to turn to our first uh, speaker, Ms. Uh, Virginia Manziti. Uh, I believe you have a PowerPoint presentation, so we will share that in a few seconds. And um, Virginia, you are the head of um, sector on gender and non-discrimination in the Directorate General of International Partnerships, DG INPA, and you've been closely involved, of course, in the development of the GAP3 um, in the current one, but also especially now in the follow-up in terms of um, actual implementation. So we're very much looking forward to hear you say a little bit more about how you are supporting um, the EU delegations in the implementation of the GAP3 um, at this very moment, but of course also um, in the future. So, Virginia, over to you.
Virginia, do you, you might still be on mute. I don't know if you've. Yes, sorry. Oh, no problem, no problem. Sorry, sorry, in this virtual world, yeah. uh, <laughs> sometimes you speak alone. <laughs> so, uh, again, thanks a lot for, uh, for organizing this webinar, which is really, I, I'm really speaking genuinely of interest for us. We really liked the study. Uh, colleagues uh, and myself, we read with interest your paper and found it thought provoking and good quality. So it's important for us to reconvene and see how things are evolving. And uh, uh, we really need this type of uh, we say exchange and uh, looking at gap free, which is our daily job uh, from different perspective. And it's important to keep really an eye, a critical eye on how implementation is going. So we do believe that gap free is really a golden opportunity for uh, gender equality to be more prominent in programming. And so we are living and going through crucial days and uh, uh, there are a lot of things happening these days. Uh, and it's really important uh, to not to miss any opportunity. So as you know, we are quite busy uh, on, uh, on one side uh, setting on track gap free implementation with a number of tools and uh, initiative and on the other side uh, trying to mainstream as best as we can uh, the pro um, process of developing MIPS, Team Europe initiative and CLIPS. Uh, so maybe the slide, yes, I just put together a few, uh, a few points uh, also thinking at your paper uh, so, the way we present a state of play on gap free implementation follows a bit some of your remarks in your paper, which uh, somehow called on our attention. So, I start from gender focal person because I thought what you said was also quite interesting. Uh, mm, there is a discussion ongoing on a, a, this function, which is critical, but in a way uh, also somehow need to be uh, really refreshed and revamped. So we know that uh, if we want GAPFRI to deliver, uh, it's a shared responsibility. It cannot stay on the shoulder only of a gender focal person. And uh, from what I see, I'm quite new in, in, in my function, gender is everywhere, is on all countries, in all sectors. So, uh, gap free is really everybody business. Gender focal person remain, well, they've played a critical role, uh, but uh, uh, they need a sort of new impetus. Uh, so, we really try to refresh uh, their responsibility, their task, engage more. So, we have a new network uh, in the delegation and in a quarter. We try to motivate thematic and geo gender focal person in that quarter to drive the agenda, their own agenda. I don't know, for example, working on digital transition, we have a lot of uh, interest from the gender focal person in this area, Green Deal. So they need to really to engage and go. You know? um, we had a very interesting forum recently uh, for all gender, not only gender focal person, but also human rights focal person just a few days ago. And we see that there are in many delegations, interestingly, uh, new options popping up. So there are delegations where there is no more one gender focal person. There are more than one sitting in all section. Uh, there are task force. Uh, and to understand a bit more how it's going, we did a survey. Next slide. Uh, to have a sort of baseline on uh, where we are with this function. Um, with pleasure, we noted that uh, about 40% of the respondents are or have a middle management position. Of course, many of them have also other uh, focal points function. This could be also good because gender is not a separate uh, playground. It needs to be as much as possible integrated. Um, Three quarter of the respondent consider that they are knowledgeable about gender action plans and about gender uh, in uh, international partnership. Uh, and half of the respondents consider uh, their uh, role is already in the job description. They feel that commitment in Iraq is growing. 
Uh, so this is also a good point. So gap free is making its way. Uh, the next slide. Um, there are still 40% considering that GAFRI is not being operationalized enough. Okay, this is how you see the, the empty or the full uh, uh, glass. So this means also that 60% consider that GAFRI is being operationalized, so we like it. Um, okay, still 50% 50, 50 consider that there are problems in incorporating a gender analysis in project design. And this were there is a core for us to, to support more. And then the most important factor for success uh, hierarchy, and this comes in all our uh, meeting webinars, but also colleagues' commitment, so teamwork and time. Okay, this just to give you an overview of the fact that we try to take, uh, you say, take the pulse of what's going on at gender focal person level. Um, so next slide. Um, then the other, important point in your report coming across all section is about uh, management commitment and engagement uh, we try to involve as much as possible out of delegation in our events and training uh, i think we already have a sort of a team of informal allies following us supporting us among out of delegation um, we have uh, the job description uh, responsibility relating to gap-free implementation already integrated for INTPA managers. So um, this is important, it's a new element. We are preparing uh, a first pilot uh, training for adult delegation and uh, will come up before the summer. And we are trying to uh, reflect with AIS on what we can do more uh, beyond the classical training, sort of other activities, kind of coaching, for example. Sophie, you tell me if I take too much time. I am not a, a clock keeper myself. I'm keeping an uh, eye uh, on the clock, but go ahead, uh, Virginia, you're good. Okay, uh, so next slide. Um, yeah, training and guidance. A lot has been done, really. We try to moderate a bit ourselves because we also need to keep in mind that there is a uh, capacity to absorb and to digest everything, but I think colleagues in our team has been really, really very efficient and quick and uh, trying to, to, to be really effective. So we have a lot of products uh, being already delivered. We have a self-paced online course on gap free. We have a lot of basic training done already. We have uh, also a special for GFP session done more advanced. Uh, we had developed a clip webinar. Sorry, there is a typo in the slide. Developing a clip, uh, it, it was the title of a webinar. Who we received a lot of attention. So we had hundreds of gender focal person following it. And we are delivering on uh, thematic training. So uh, besides not counting with webinars, we have already trained 600 person. Uh, we have developed some guidance uh, and uh, uh, I think that the clip is now what is in our radar really to support clip development, but also thematic guidance. And we see, uh, I would say, a lot of interest uh, from, uh, from gender focal person from delegation. Next slide. Uh, sharing knowledge, sharing intelligence. So this is uh, just for you to, to see what uh, the tools we work with. It's very important to, uh, I would say, motivate each other to cross fertilize. So we try to make, um, uh, to build a sort of common space where gender focal person can see what's going on in the neighboring countries, uh, understanding uh, what is a gender country profile uh, in the country similar to, to theirs. What is a gender sector analysis? There is a lot of interest on it. Uh, what are the good practice? And this is also speaks to your interest on intersectional and transformational approach. So we are building this platform. We have other platforms online as well. Next slide. Uh, sorry, not this one. We're training. Okay, this is uh, the training access. And uh, next one. Uh, we have also a private group for gender focal person on capacity for deaf to share good practice. And uh, Next, 
We are trying, and this is an important one. Uh, there's a lot of work behind it. Uh, we are trying to, to communicate better. So to, to have a newsletter for all, not only for gender focused person, really revamped. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of intense work uh, on the reporting system. So we have uh, good indicators in the staff working documents. We are now uh, building a, a system to integrate them in our mechanics uh, from our side, but also building a system with member states for joint reporting. So this is done in coordination with member states in a dedicated working group. And uh, I really liked your point uh, in your report on the need to close the loop between reporting and learning and communication, innovation. So we would like this reporting system to really give space to qualitative reporting and to tell the story of transformational initiative and approach. And I think this is really the key elements for, for a walking the talk on, uh, on this principle. Also letting uh, colleagues learn from each other and uh, uh, somehow being provoked that what's going on in our country and spaces. Next. Yeah, programming, a few slides on programming. So uh, you might all have seen this slide in a way or another. It's our, I would say it's our clock, it's our compass. So um, gender country profile are uh, on their way. So in many countries, they are really quite on track in uh, developing or updating. And we see a lot of joint work, a lot of coordination. Uh, so, uh, what we really wanted is that it's not a separate exercise, but is also important process-wide to do it together, to build a uh, no, common approach, uh, common understanding of the challenges based on consultation. And we have still this is a very important deadline for uh, CLIPS to be ready by end of July. We are already seeing a lot of interest on gender sector analysis. So this is our compass and it's moving. It's really moving, I think. Uh, next slide. Uh, on MIPS, uh, so you, you are of course, and uh, rightly so very interested in what's going on in gender mainstreaming on MIPS. Um, we are following it very closely, believe us. It's a lot of work for colleagues sitting in all country team meetings and really uh, a lot of engagement. And uh, um, there is a progress, uh, so uncomparable situation if we look at uh, the previous programming cycle. So gap free has an impact, but of course, uh, mixed result. This is a part of the game, but uh, very few gender blind MIPS. So um, the ones which are already finalized normally are all uh, gender uh, sensitive or responsive. So we see that there is a lot of progress on MIPS and in many cases there are different degrees of integration. In many cases you have really indicators and objective already there. So you, you really see that an effort is done to integrate gap-free indicators into the MIPS. We cannot really share uh, a lot of details on this because as you know MIPS are not yet formal or uh, so it, it will be a bit slippery to share too many names and, and list countries. Um, next slide. But I would like to give you an example. Uh, oh, and, uh, yeah. Sorry, could I um, maybe suggest if we can, perhaps we can bring the examples in the, in the discussion or in the Q&A afterwards, if they okay. come in handy. And uh, so then we can move uh, to the other speakers as okay, well. Okay, I can stop here and um, then interview later. Not... Okay, great. Um, I, but you had one more slide at the end, I think. Maybe you have a final point to make before we move to... No, I want to say just that we are also working hard to, to really uh, better coordination with member states. And this is also a very important point in your report, which was quite thought-provoking for us. Um, coordination with member states uh, in the free country you study were not really satisfactory, also the political engagement and uh, so there is a link with political dialogue, so this is quite important for us to follow and uh, so we're trying from our perspective at quarter to, to support work in this direction. 
Great. Thank you so much, Virginia, for your first remarks. And, and also very happy to hear, of course, that the research by my colleagues was, uh, was thought for provoking and, and useful to you. Um, and uh, looking forward to hear more from you in the in the remainder of the of the event and the Q and A, um, I'd like to move from headquarters to the field now and move to Miss um, Isabel Faya de Almeida. Um, Isabel, you are the head of the head of cooperation at the EU delegation in Mozambique, and uh, what I wanted to ask you is really the delegation experience and how you are integrating the Gap Three concretely into the programming in uh, Mozambique. And if you could tell us a little bit more about how you're doing this, but also uh, who your principal interlocutors are in, in this process. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. And also thank you for the opportunity uh, for us in Mozambique to share our experience uh, here in the field. Um, so it, it is really a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, as Sophie said, I'm head of cooperation. I'm also one of the heads of cooperation that is also part of the management. So I'm head of unit. So, uh, this, this gives somehow a little bit more, more leverage. Um, and, uh, we, we have been investing a lot. Uh, in uh, gender issues here in Mozambique. So, uh, just for, for you to understand, Mozambique has quite a good uh, legislatory framework. So, the laws are good, only they are not implemented. Uh, you have a very, very unequal access to education with a very few number of girls that continue to secondary school uh, and also the access to economic as uh, assets is very, very limited for uh, women. Uh, you have the rates of illiteracy. Uh, so, uh, around 60% of the women in this country are not able to read while uh, the same percentage is 30% for men. So you have a huge challenge to, to deal with. And we think that without tackling the issue of uh, women uh, and uh, girls equality, uh, there cannot be development in Mozambique. <laughs> that is one of the basics uh, here for us. So uh, what, we, what we do is, uh, I, I would say it is basically in three types of activities. The first one, and in your paper, you mentioned that very well, is focusing on political and policy dialogue. So it's not only the political dialogue that takes place with the ambassadors uh, on a regular uh, time uh, timeline, but also all our meetings uh, uh, that we have with partners, being it ministers, uh, development partners or CSOs, we bring gender issues quite uh, frequently to the table of discussion. What we do also that I think it's uh, maybe of interest for some other delegations is we have 11 member states that are uh, represented in Mozambique. So every year we choose one topic that has a political uh, importance for the country. Uh, and then around that topic, we do a common field trip um together so with the member states and uh following that uh, that field visit we come with a, a set of key messages that we use in our policy dialogue uh so we go we liaise with the ministries we liaise with the provincial authorities but also with development partners and csos in 2019 we chose gender as a topic so we have been outside in the field uh, looking at a number of uh, uh, gender programs and uh, uh, we set a number of key messages and only that's a, a happy coincidence only this morning we met the minister of gender to convey these messages so uh, i was there together with my 11 uh, colleagues and we had quite a, a rich and a good discussion so always bring gender
Isabel, are you still there? I think probably Isabel's connection dropped for a while. Um, of course, we hope that she can make it back uh, to the meeting as soon as possible. And so we can hear more of the, the experience in Mozambique delegation. Um, let's move to the next speaker and uh, we'll pick up with Isabel uh, when she's able to, to rejoin the meeting. Uh, Mr. Vincent Maher, I would like to turn to you. Um, Vincent, you are the Deputy Head of uh, Development at the Irish Embassy in uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And you're also coordinating the donor group around health in Ethiopia, which touches on a lot of gender issues and uh, seems to have been an entry point to address gender related matters in Ethiopia. Um, thank you very much for um, taking the time to speak to us today. And I wanted to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about how the EU and the member states uh, are coordinating on gender in, in Ethiopia and maybe touch upon the question on whether the EU and the member states have indeed a joint up strategic approach to gender and some of the challenges the EU and member states might have, uh, might face in doing so. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, and thanks for inviting me today. Um, it's, it's a pleasure uh, to speak to everybody. Um, I think it follows um, some of the survey work that's been done in previous times. Um, so, particularly on coordination on gender, I mean, I'm I'm in um, I'm in Ethiopia almost two years. It's been the period of COVID, of course, and many other things in Ethiopia. For those of you who know the country, unfortunately. Um, and I think so. Coordination has been has been challenging in, in 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 that regard, but nevertheless, I think you know the EU has been you know very regular in 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 bringing us together um, to discuss key issues. Um, I think one important aspect is is um, a number of EU member states have supported the development of a new gender sector working group in Ethiopia, and and we've just had the first two meetings of that with government, and I think. That gives the opportunity to to bring up um, the level of dialogue a level, and 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 that's great. But just uh, coordination within EU has been quite strong, and obviously um, a lot of it in in the last twelve months focusing on the gap and then the the country level uh, Im Im implementation plan. Um, as you said, the the EU have a quite a strong focus on health and their G2 marker in Ethiopia is basically linked to their health sector um, budget support disbursements. Um, and, and that's an interesting approach. Um, undoubtedly, it's relevant in, in that um, from a programmatic perspective, there's a, a significant focus on SRHR and family planning. Um, I think what's yet to be determined is how far we just move beyond the financing and 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 how can we take um, a truly transformative approach. Um, I think the first version of the MIP, I, I remember making some comments on this and saying that, okay, the words gender transformation were, um, were there, but you didn't really feel it coming out in substance. Um, and I think there has been iterations of the MIP and, and I know at the moment, um, we're all providing input into the country level Im implementation plan. And there we hope uh, the substance truly comes out. Because, for example, if you're working in the health sector as your kind of um, landmark program, and um, yes, you're, you're providing funding and you're monitoring the indicators, but I think there has to be more to it than that. Um, I think the research and learning uh, aspect is potentially very interesting. And if, um, I think it's, it's very important as the EU, if we can combine all of our resources together to invest in research um, that focuses on a gender transformative approach. Um, so, for, for example, um, our, our embassy uh, at the end of last year have started to fund um, a five-year research program 
on ending FGM and child marriage in, in some of the lowland regions of Ethiopia, which have some of the highest rates in the world. And I know that this is also a common area of interest for EU colleagues. And so we have at the moment discussed the need to bring our work together and, 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 to, and, and to combine our resources. That doesn't necessarily mean we all fund the same research and look for the same results. I think it might, it might be sometimes about how we can use different types of research, but use the information gathered then in, in common purpose. So I think there's a good intention to do that. And the hope is that, that, that all of this research will look at social norms, you know, we'll, 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 we'll look at the political aspects of gender transformation. At, at local level, you know, at regional levels, and, and in in um, in Ethiopia, sorry, regional level means subnational level, and and then at, at national or, or federal level, as 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 we say in Ethiopia, you know, can you know can we recognise that gender is dynamic? You know, it's not just about these are the these are the traditional roles, and 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 that um. What gender means in a particular context can change over time. And I think sometimes when I've spoken about this in Ethiopia or other contexts, I've used the example of my own country and some of the significant changes that have taken place in Ireland over the last decade. And this is kind of proof that gender is not just about being a static culture, but what is about being uh, something much more dynamic. Yeah, so I really, I'll just summarize by saying that, that we really look forward to working with EU colleagues and, and other member states, you know, to really invest not only in, in financing and monitoring, but also in research and learning aspects, and then using that research and learning to feed into our in, in, into our policy dialogue. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, you know, in, in Ethiopia, um, you know, to, to, to really learn and hopefully make, make, make a difference. But sometimes it's about learning about what doesn't work as well. And it's about that ability to be open um, about what's not working, because uh, many of us are very invested in our success, I suppose, at times. And, and, and I think sometimes there needs to be a, a, a bit of humility and, and at least recognize we've tried this. In theory, it looked good. It's in line with all our global agreements, but it's just not delivering the impact that we hope it might. And those things, I think, can only be addressed over a five, 10 year period. So. We're very much looking at our approach in gender transformation over two mission strategy cycles. And for us, that'll be around 10 years. And I think if we are hoping to, to drive transformative change to some degree, we have to look at it in that type of time frame. Um, so I think I'll finish there. If there's any questions, maybe um, I, I can come in again afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vincent, and indeed very interesting to hear your thoughts also on longer term perspectives and the learning and the ability also to adapt programming if you notice that certain things are just maybe not working as you initially planned. Uh, and, and we'd be happy to hear more about it uh, in the, in the, in the follow-up questions. Um, I also see that Isabel has been able to return. Isabel, can you hear me? And Yes. Yes, yes. I, I see you as well. Yeah. Great. Um, you were talking last about joint missions with um, member states um, and also exchanges with authorities, local authorities. So if you'd want to, in the general discussion about your activities in Mozambique, if you yeah. want to pick up uh, on that and then, uh, yeah, please go yeah. ahead. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So here it's not only gender that is a challenge, connection is also a very... <laughs> So, uh, okay, I hope that now I can, uh, I, I can make it. So, I was uh, uh, telling about our joint missions with the member states that allow us to have a set of key messages with EVs on gender. Uh, and uh, I was saying that it was a coincidence, but today we had the meeting with the Ministry of Gender and uh, uh, Social Action exactly to convey the messages of our joint mission. So it was me and also, of course, the 11 member states, and we did a good division of labor. So this is also quite related to joint programming, but uh, also working on gender. So I think that the policy dialogue is a key uh, element in bringing the gender agenda uh, forward, and it requires a lot of coordination 
uh, it requires some leadership from the, the delegation uh, side, but also a lot of persistence because you have things are not easy and it's not everybody that is always ready to listen to you. So it's the combination of these uh, three things. The second uh, group of topics that I wanted to, to mention as uh, gender action here in Mozambique is that we are lucky uh, that we are one of the eight countries of Africa that has a specific program only on gender. So we uh, have Spotlight Initiative that is a, a program on uh, eradication of all types of uh, uh, gender-based violence. And this has been instrumental, to be frank, because the fact that we do it uh, together with uh, several uh, coalition, let's say, of the United uh, Nations agencies together with us and the member states, and we have some member states that are the champions on gender, all this together uh, brought a lot of visibility and uh, we put gender topics on the, the table of discussions. And the last of the three uh, things that I wanted to mention is the mainstreaming. I, I, to be frank, I think that this is the most difficult of, of all. Because what happens is that uh, in a delegation, no one will ever tell you, oh, I don't agree with gender equality. Now, everybody says, oh, interesting. That's very interesting. But then between the words and do, there is a big, uh, a big gap. And then, uh, Virginia, sorry to say, come those terrible uh, reports always that we have to feel uh, and then we have to mobilize member states. And then this is the report number 300 almost in one year because we have to report on trade, on uh, climate, on human rights, the, the, the global report on uh, external uh, assistance. So the reporting, I think that there is a lot of overlapping and repetition uh, and there is not always the enthusiasm for another reporting and now on gender. So uh, uh, here the narrative need, needs to change. So this mainstreaming is complex. What we do, for example, we try when we are working on an infrastructure project and sometimes uh, the, 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 there is a lot of technical work. My, I have colleagues that are engineers that know everything about how to build a road or a hospital or whatever. And then there comes us saying, oh, with the gender, you need to have to, the gender lens, the gender perspective. And this requires uh, a sensitization of everybody, but also the trainings that Virginia, she, she was uh, mentioning, but insisting uh, again that we need even in things that apparently don't have much the moment that you build a road you are impacting on the access of girls to school you are impacting on the livelihoods of women that sell their products in the market so i, I in a nutshell there's that is basically the three um vehicles let's say uh, that we use in delegation the mainstreaming having a fully fledged gender program and political and policy dialogue. Um, I, I would say that in a, as a conclusion, what we need is to have a strategy and the gap three really brings the strategy in a strategic moment because we are doing programming. So it's very helpful and uh, it requires a lot of persistence and leadership. So this is basically what uh, I wanted to share, I will be very happy to to discuss and uh, to intervene with colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, your connection is still a little bit choppy, so um, we'll make sure that if there's a little disruption that you get some time to repeat the question or your answer in the Q&A. Um, and also, um, please let us know from the audience whether you have difficulties hearing Isabel. We'll try to work around it as we go along. Um, after having heard from the three speakers, I'd very much like to turn to my colleague, uh, Chloe Thieven, um, before heading into the Q&A with the audience. Um, Chloe, you're one of the authors of our report. And um, I, I wanted to ask you, after having heard the speakers, if you could share us um, your reflections on what some of the key opportunities and, and challenges are in terms of implementing the GAP3. 
Uh, looking forward to hear from you, Chloe. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers for their invaluable contributions. Um, I think um, this is a great opportunity to discuss this topic further and also to feed into the work that we will be do doing over the coming months um, on this topic. Um, so, um, as already mentioned, our initial study um, looked at the first stages of the implementation of the GAP3. And as Virginia has mentioned already, this process is moving on. Um, we, we carried out three limited case studies for that, for that uh, paper, looking at Mozambique, Mali and Ethiopia, um, and conducted over 35 interviews with um, EU and member state officials, as well as with the gender ministries in the three countries, with CSOs, both in Europe and in, um, and in those three countries. Um, and in the coming months, we, we do plan to do more work um, looking at the implementation, but also looking in more detail at the new principles of the GAP3. As Sophie mentioned, we have a particular interest in this. Um, and I would like to focus now a little bit more on these principles, particularly the intersectionality and the transformative intersectionality principle and the transformative approach as the human rights approach is, is a little bit more um, was was there in the gap too, um, and I think is understood a bit more broadly. Um, I'll also touch on cooperation with local actors if we have the time, um, as this kind of goes hand in hand with, um, particularly with the transformative approach. Um, so um, when we were conducting the study, we really found that there's a huge amount of interest and enthusiasm amongst actors working on gender and development in Europe, um, amongst the member states, among CSOs. Um, uh, there was a sense that these, these principles really do mark a step forward in terms of the approach to, um, to gender in development um, and in external action more broadly. Um, but moving them forward in uh, partner countries, as Vincent mentioned, it will require a lot of learning along the way. Um, th these are not uh, these are not simple things to implement through um, projects and programs, um, and uh, a lot will will need to be done to move from theory to action. Um, so to start with the intersectional approach. Um, this, in the context of the GAP3, means paying attention to other factors that might uh, further disadvantage women, including racial, ethnic, and religious background, age, disability, and sexuality. Um, and uh, as part of the GAP3, EU delegations will be, as, as Virginia mentioned, um, EU delegations will be um, updating their gender country profiles. So this is a very important moment to look at these inter intersectionalities. Um, it offers an opportunity to analyze other structural power imbalances in partner countries and how these intersect with gender, um, which um, could be an important step forward in terms of figuring out how to integrate intersectionality into um, the, the, the design, the planning, and the reporting of actions in partner countries. Um, our research to date found that disability was the intersectionality that was most widely appreciated um, and integrated into some projects and programs in partner countries. Um, uh, the Spotlight Initiative, um, which Isabel mentioned, which is a flagship initiative of the EU in partnership with the UN, um, does try to integrate, certainly in certain countries, is trying to integrate the specific vulnerabilities of women with disabilities. Um, however, some of the other intersectionalities that um, uh, haven't been so closely um, examined yet, um, most notably around LGBTIQ rights. Um, these seem to have, in certain in certain countries, um, we, we noted particularly in Mali and Ethiopia that these had less salience in national debates and in development cooperation. Um, and indeed, in Mali, many interviewees, both European and Malian, uh, noted that 
one must adapt to local realities um, and that in a highly conservative society, there's only so far one can push certain agendas. So this is, this is something that will need to be um, approached with uh, tact if, if it is to be approached. Um, on the transformative approach, uh, this is defined in the gap three as examining, questioning and changing rigid gender norms and imbalances of power which disadvantage women and girls and generate discriminations at all ages, starting from early childhood. Um, so this term has been growing in salience in the academic literature around gender and um, development. Um, and it's already noticeable in certain approaches, um, but it is quite difficult to integrate this more qualitative uh, view of progress um, into development programs and projects, which often have short-term quantitative indicators. Whereas to, to measure transformative change, as Vincent mentioned, this can be a long-term process. And furthermore, it's not easily quantifiable. Um, so this is, a, a lot of programs tend to focus on things like women's economic empowerment or livelihood creation, because this is something that is easier to quantify and that can be um, that can be easily um, uh, enumerated in uh, the indicators in the reporting. Um, however, um, when it comes to long term transformative change, it is important to to focus on both shifting individual consciousness so that women realize what their what their abilities are and how to how to um, overturn limiting normative beliefs and expectations, but also to engage with wider culturally embedded norms and practices. Um, so one example that we give in the report is the agricultural sector where women play a vital role in Africa. Um, and yet a lot of work still needs to be done to uh, change behavior and attitudes so that women are seen as capable economic actors. Um, uh, engaging men is also a, a vital part of the transformative approach um, as transformative change requires the whole society to, to, to change. Um, so um, in conclusion, one of the most important elements in terms of this transformative approach is certainly going to be around the indicators in the reporting around the gap three. Um, and um, I think as Vincent's um, uh, intervention uh, suggested, working with member states that are trying things out in this area will be very important. Um, pulling on best practices um, that some uh, that, that may already exist um, in partner countries. Um, and ECDBM will be doing further work on this in the coming months. So we hope to, to be able to share further best practices from around the world. Um, then just to mention, because it's quite closely linked, but I won't, I won't speak about it for long because I don't want to take too much time. Um, but uh, one of the, if, in order to make these transformative, um, particularly in order to tackle transformative change um, by tackling cultural norms and political sensitivities, it's of course vital to work with local actors, including local governments, but also civil society actors in partner countries, um, as well as with business, with activists, with religious leaders. Um, and this is recognized both in the GAP3 and in the programming guidelines, um, which require EU delegations to consult local actors for the preparation, both of the MIPS, the multi-annual indicative programs, and in the CLIPS, which are the country level implementation programs uh, for, for on gender. Um, uh, and um, they also need to, delegations also need to submit a list of CSOs they have consulted in the programming process. Um, many are also um, developing civil society roadmaps. Um, so there has been a great deal of, of um, consultation with civil society and with local governments through this process. Um, but our research did note that this varied quite a lot from country to country and that there might be ways in which 
this um, this consultation and this work with civil society could be qualitative, qualitatively improved. Um, and uh, I won't touch on that much longer right now, but it it might be something that we could come to again in the in the conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chloe. Um, and uh, let me allow the audience a few more seconds to warm up uh, preparing their questions. Perhaps I see one question already from uh, Celine Mias. Um, and I'll take that uh, in a few instances. It's about civil society engagement, what you touched upon as well, Chloe, engaging with feminists, women's rights organizations that have a role in pointing to discriminatory, discriminatory um, uh, practices and can also discuss norms and intersectionality. Um, perhaps, Virginia, could you come back to this point of intersectionality specifically and how the EU is trying to address this in, in its support, for example, uh, to EU delegations, also in your trainings, but also you talked about the reporting and trying to include more of a learning perspective and also trying to monitor qualitative changes uh, uh, over time, uh, per perhaps a first reaction, and of course, Isabel and Vincent, uh, let me know if you'd like to come in on that as well. And then uh, I'd like to take the question from Celine on civil society engagement. Virginia? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the intervention by our colleague in, in Ethiopia on health uh, provides half of the answer. I mean, I think it really need to be uh, humble and uh, to 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 learn from uh, uh, from where we are and in which context. So I don't think there are standard solution for uh, uh, solving this issue and being transformational or uh, I would say. Uh, intersectionally compliant. So, uh, of course, we need an ambition, and this is the direction of, uh, of our journey. Uh, but we need to contextualize and and to localize. So, without uh, attention and humility to the country context, uh, we will only impose a solution that might not fly everywhere. So I think context facilitation is really essential. That's why we think, of course, we will support. And uh, as you might understand so far, we have been really busy for the big, uh, setting the big framework and the big scene. Uh, and now we will dig more and invest more in supporting um, program design and, uh, uh, and how to innovate and to be innovative. Um, so, uh, uh, of course, we can do a lot, but I think that the, the, uh, the knowledge or understanding of the country context and even regional uh, context, it's the most important thing. And engaging with local actors and uh, uh, as you, as uh, uh, you say, coming from uh, uh, outsider, uh, we can only uh, learn and accompany process which uh, should be owned and rooted in the cultural context. Um, I believe that, uh, as you rightly point in your report, local ownership is essential, and so we need to be able to engage in the long term, in the medium term, with uh, uh, agents of change which are and belong uh, to, to the country. From our perspective, we see that we can really foster uh, research, uh, cross-fertilization, learning by reporting narrative, and we can engage with actors which are closer to culture. So, for example, we are trying to engage with uh, mobilization of uh, uh, the creative sector, um, so movie, cinema, television, media, so the one we're closer to the, I just say to 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 the soft uh, and deep dimension of, of uh, society and what you mentioned, Chloe, which is very important, the individual consciousness, which is very often also the social one. So 
um, and to get there, we need a, a lot of humility, but we also need to engage with actors who are able to to touch this part um, of the of society, which very often are also cultural actors. Uh, and then on the other extreme, we are trying to develop indicators and to support the use of indicators, which more than ever uh, can help to uh, to measure this and so to uh, to indicate and give us some uh, direction. So out of the long list of indicators we have, there are some who are uh, more fit for the purpose to, to, mm -hmm. to measure uh, this type of changes. But uh, I mean, we have a lot of uh, ideas, intentions, but I'm really personally convinced that uh, if we don't have a local understanding, we'll not make it. And so there is a lot of uh, country to be made, a uh, lot of work to be made at country level. A last point on intersectionality. We are working on gender and uh, um, freedom of religion, belief and religion. So on this, we have done already some uh, studies, some reflection on how to engage with faith based actors and how to promote gender equality and freedom of religion, belief jointly. So these are. Two, uh, two aspects which are very often considered uh, in friction or even uh, conflictual, while they can also be absolutely synergetic and complementary. So we are trying to mobilize also the, this two track. All right. Thank, for the moment. thank you, Virginia. Um, that's quite interesting to hear also on the engagement of religious actors, which was also something that came up in some of the country case studies interviews, uh, for example, um, in Mali and how to engage men as well as change actors um, in the case where a lot of religious leaders are still still men in, men, in many places. Um, I was wondering if Isabel could take the question on civil society engagement and perhaps speak to her country uh, experience on how that that has happened in Mozambique. Yes. Can you hear uh, us, Isabel? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, for the Mozambique uh, experience, we have quite a number of CSOs working in the field of gender contrary to other fields that we don't have really uh, much interest gender there is something where there is a lot and they are very valuable uh, CSOs doing very good work what we do also we have a gender group uh, that is on gender and citizenship and uh, uh, several times per year, we try to put people together and together with also the member states and to discuss and talk about uh, the issues of, uh, of uh, interest. Uh, so I think that the work of uh, the CSOs here in Mozambique in the field of uh, gender is very valuable. Right, thank you very much. Um, Vincent, I see a question coming in for you, perhaps a bit more actually from one of our uh, colleagues, um, Mariela. She has a question about working better together and uh, how um, the GAP3 guide, if, the, if it will guide or drive EU member states' actions, uh, also their uh, bilateral cooperation. So how the GAP3 might um, create a stimulus for advancing, um, working on gender, women's empowerment, but also, of course, the new principles in, in their bilateral actions. Could you could you speak to that question? Okay. Uh, I might come back to the civil society question as well from here because I, I, I have a very easy answer to that one. I'm in a fortunate position. Um, I think processes like GAP3, and I, I think what's what I found good, and I suppose as a non-gender expert um, com uh, coming into this process around a couple of years ago, is, is that moving from the gap tree to, to the MIP to the CLIP itself it, and, and, and developing our inputs into those various processes is, is, is a really good way of actually strengthening our coordination um, around gender equality. 
I think the big issue probably is um, when this kind of design process, um, when that period come, come, comes to a close, and of course we'll be reinvesting in it as, as we go along and learning from it, um, to what extent are leaders in our various organisations, you know, take this as a critical part of their work? Um, We've our own experience, um, let's say from our previous strategy, which was pre-2020 around a five-year strategy, is that we had become gender sensitive in the way that we try to ensure uh, equality in participation and 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 so on, and, and equality in, 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 in benefit. Um, but we felt that we were still falling far short in, in terms of issues of empowerment. And this is inherently, uh, I mentioned earlier, a political Before, issue, you know, sorry, about, it's an issue about power dynamics. And can we convince our leaders and our organisations, you know, to consistently engage in gender in, let's say, the way they would around economy, you know? We know that our our ambassadors, our, our, our heads uh, will be very interested in promoting economic relationships, you, 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 you know, be, between the EU and, and member states. But will we invest in gender in that way during our, our political visits, during, during our, the, our, 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 our high rep, our HRBPs, our, our, our ministers, when, when we're coming to visit countries, is gender equality going to be a priority? I think that's going to be the real test of transforming the gap, which I think the process in Ethiopia has, has gone quite well so far in terms of, of interaction uh, between the member states. I mean, but, but, but taking it up to the next level uh, will, will be quite important. Um, just on the civil society question from CARE International, um, I think it's very interesting. Uh, we fund two international NGOs uh, to do gender equality work in Ethiopia, and one of them is Care International. And it was a very uh, interesting piece of work. It was a concept which Care actually uh, brought to us, because there is a, a revision of the national women's policy in Ethiopia, and that's what it used to be called. And there's an ambition that it'll be a gender policy, and and. Um, uh, and hopefully it will be. I, I just said to the minister, just just call it gender policy every, every time you're talking about it, and it'll turn into a gender policy. Um, but it was quite obvious that it was um, almost an elite-driven gender policy, and sure by well-minded people. But CARE's concept was actually to do consultations at 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 a community level, at local level, and bring those consultations into the national gender policy. And they came up with very interesting findings. One of them is that uh, local men and women, you know, had, had actually perceived Ethiopia has, has, has progressed a lot over the last couple of decades since the introduction of the national women's policy. And I think that progress was similar to our own findings in our mission strategy that I, des I, I described um, a couple of minutes ago. So about, you know, people's... Uh, greater equality in participation and, 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 and so on and so forth. But I think it was also clear from those consultations that issues around power dynamics have not yet been dressed, uh, addressed in, in, in Ethiopia in, in terms of policy. And I hope that those consultations with grassroots or, or organizations and, and people will really you know, help drive that message um, now at policy level and that, the new, that Ethiopia's new gender policy uh, will really address issues around social norms and power dynamics. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent, for uh, for those responses and and yeah, fascinating perspectives as well to really pick up on those grassroots. And approach. Sophie, your audio is breaking down. So I will perhaps abuse my. 
Sophie, can you hear me now? Hear you. <laughs> it seems to be a little bit better now. No, it, it's broken down. Um, perhaps um, <laughs> I'll take over while Sophie's, uh, Sophie's audio uh, gets back on track. So even in Brussels, it seems that we can have uh, audio issues these days. Um, but I see that we, we do have another question coming through um, from Margot Jones at the European Peacebuilding Liaison Office in Brussels. Um, who asks, um, I was wondering if the speakers could reflect on how the integration of the new key areas of engagement, including WPS, Women, Peace and Security, that is, uh, digitalization uh, and the green transition in the gap three have gone so far. Um, so perhaps um, we might start with, with Virginia's view from headquarters and then move on to Isabel on this question. Yeah, um, we started from the green transition because this is really one of the most frequent uh, areas for a new, the new MIPS coming up. And uh, we did a lot of work in trying to understand better how to bring the gap perspective into this. And I think it's working well. We have done webinars with a lot of participation and trying to really help colleagues uh, drafting the MIPS and uh, the future one to implement. Uh, to come with concrete uh, uh, ideas of action, objective results. So I think uh, Green Deal has been particularly uh, successful in this and also digitalization. We are doing a first training on, uh, in 10 days on this and uh, buying also into a very rich study, which was already there on uh, women and digital uh, in Africa, a very, very detailed one. Um, we are working on women, peace and security also, uh, looking at all the MIPS which contain this type of uh, uh, engagement in under governance, the governance pillar. And um, again, we, we are planning a training very soon. So we are proceeding by, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, somehow uh, working really closely with thematic colleagues and then jointly preparing uh, guidance, briefs, piece of thinking and training. And we see it's moving. For the moment, I think. And then the, the, the interesting part is still to come when the, the program will, uh, will pop up. But I would like to say something in relation to this. The most important for me, a piece of the puzzle are the clips. So uh, what is going on now at country level is that uh, building on gender country profile, uh, colleagues are developing these clips and there we will see how these new themes, uh, green, digital, WPS are taken on board because they're in the clip format, uh, they will have to choose and select the areas. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Um, and Isabel, um, would you like to come in on this question? Yes. If you're, if you're yes. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so indeed, we integrated this in, in the MIP, this uh, dimension of uh, women, peace, and, and security, because you know that uh, Mozambique has had a conflict. Uh, for years, and now there is a second conflict that adds to the first. Women, they have been uh, uh, the first victims, women and children of, of both, and now we have a, a terrible situation in the north of the country. So, uh, in the reflection on the nexus, the triple nexus between humanitarian development and, and, and peace and security, this aspect of women and peace and security has uh, been uh, really looked at. And in our discussions with the member states, we, we decided to put a stronger emphasis on, on that. Of course, that in the MIP, what we, what we include is still quite a, a broad overview. And the moment that we'll start proposing programs, identifying concrete action, 
then it's more complex, but we have lessons of, of uh, the past on working on uh, conflict affected areas, uh, especially on livelihoods and women, and we have several programs implemented by member states, so via delegated cooperation, Italy and Austria, where we uh, put the women in the center of the livelihoods dynamic. So it is a, a, an aspect that we think it is very important. And of course, we will keep uh, as the work gets more granularity uh, uh, investing in, in this field. Great, thank you so much, Isabel. Chloe, uh, I hope my connection is better now, so I can. Uh, okay, I see you nodding, so that's good. I hope it holds for um, for a few more minutes. Um, we have uh, Krina who'd like to come in with a question. Uh, Krina, the floor is yours, so please uh, go ahead. You can activate your camera or um, yeah, identify yourself and uh, pose your question directly to the speakers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Govinder. I'm from UNAIDS. Um, my question is, you know, against the backdrop of the global movement against racism and neocolonialism in public health, which also really affects the gender and women's rights movement, um, you know, uh, I would, would like to know, dig deeper into the issues of intersectionality, specifically around how um, going forward, this group would be engaging with women feminists from the global south. Um, and also experts from the Global South, not just in terms of community and civil society engagement, but also experts in the science, in the hard sciences, um, with data collection analysis of data, intersectional data, um, uh, agenda um, uh, data analysis, for example, um, making recommendations based on evidence, um, but also not just engaging at the community um, delivery or service delivery level in terms of understanding what people's uh, realities are, but also actually engaging on the hard sciences with things. Um, also, from the experience with um, with the UN, um, I, I've also it's also noted that, you know, we work with specific types of people, um, you know, engaging a, a Global South experts at cons with consultancies and at the expert level um, happens very, very rarely. So going forward, I'd like to also know how would we engage with folks from the Global South on that level as well. Thanks. Thank you. Who would like to take that question? Virginia, would you like to start and we can go to Isabel and Vincent after if they have any thoughts? Thank you, Queen. Uh, I take I take this question more as a uh, interesting, I would say, thought-provoking recommendation. Uh, as you know, I mean, the global dimension of, of the implementation of GAP3 is quite uh, marginal, so we, we are under the law of geographization, so uh, the bulk of it will happen at country level and at regional level. We don't have global programs to implement or to engage with a global uh, feminist organization, unfortunately. Um, we try to engage with uh, DG research on uh, on uh, gap free, and they were quite keen. And I know that uh, DG research is very much uh, committed to work also with uh, researcher from uh, the south as to open up. So they are uh, very gender responsive. So probably through them something could happen. Um, we are also very busy in developing their programming, so it was a bit too early for, for them to engage. Uh, but I really like your point and uh, fully in line with you. Uh, we like to have more of this, but if very much it will depend at country level and uh, and uh, maybe at regional to a certain extent. For example, in Western Africa, there will be something on uh, um, sexual reproductive health and rights and uh, uh, maybe there will be space for this type of engagement. But diversity and uh, uh, taking on board this uh, problem of local of voices, different voices, diversity of voices, it's really important. I, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Vincent, Isabel, any thoughts? I know Chloe wants to come in as well yeah. on this question. Yeah, while my connection is good, 
<laughs> I try. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, Kreen uh, for for your uh, your question, and uh, it's more like a, a suggestion. Uh, our experience here in in Mozambique. The, the first thing is. Uh, of course, th there are several um, CSOs that are feminist and that carry uh, this uh, gender uh, agenda. Um, and also there are some EU member states uh, like uh, Sweden, for example, that are champion in the field of gender. So we are working together. We have been working with, for example, Wilsa, uh, that is uh, an NGO from uh, South Africa with quite a good uh, uh, in implementation here in Mozambique. And we have been working in the areas of uh, mining where there are so many uh, problems for, for women. So there is already some tradition of working with feminist partners, let's say. But I think that uh, uh, we need indeed to step beyond them and work with those that are exactly not convinced about that. Uh, um, for, I mean, we live in, in uh, societies that uh, they have strong tradition, uh, uh, some uh, cultural practices that are not positive for women. So I, I would say that the work, for example, with religious leaders is really something that uh, is very valuable. And if we think about Cabo Delgado and, and all the conflict that is uh, developing there, uh, the, the, the religious leaders, the more traditional, let's say, the, the, the wise men of the society, they are, if we convince them, you progress uh enormously so i think that uh, um it is important to work with those that are not yet convinced and uh to do that advocacy and awareness and um even not being afraid sometimes to challenge some uh, some traditions that are uh very bad for women uh, i'm thinking for example about uh, early marriages uh, in mozambique one girl of 18 uh, already has children. More than half of the 18 years old girls, they already have one child. So um, these kind of things that uh, are not accepted as normal and, and that we try to convince society and entry by the community leaders, the religious leaders. This is what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vincent, any thoughts from your side? You wanted to respond uh, before I turn to Chloe? I, I, yeah, I can just say something very briefly to Karina's question, although I expect it was maybe pointed more directly at the EU. Um, but I would say I was interviewed uh, in, in the run up to this work. I was interviewed by an excellent person who I'm quite sure is from the Global South and was an expert uh, employed by the EU. Um, but I do think the question has resonance and um, I'm not surprised it's coming from somebody working for UNAIDS because I, I used to have some association with UNAIDS myself because I think to do they're very considered in this uh, in this area. Um, and I just, for example, point we started working with raising voices in Uganda around 20 years ago. And if you look at the impact of that work and that organization from the Global South, um, on work on gender and indeed on HIV and AIDS um, across the continent and wider, you know, I think it really points to, you know, the relevance of, of, of that investment, you know, and, and, and investing in the global south um, as, as a first priority. And yeah, acknowledging that we don't always do that. that sometimes we do take the easier answer and, you know, invest in, in an expert or a consultant that we happen to know that we're very familiar with ourselves or maybe who has relevant experience. But yeah, it's a very thought provoking question and, and, and definitely uh, something for us to think about going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Chloe. Um, yes, so I just wanted to mention that within the context of this particular study um, that we really did think about this and how to work actually with um, experts from um, 
from the countries. Um, so we worked together with an excellent uh, researcher from Mozambique called Marta Kumbi, who I believe may be uh, in the webinar today. And we will be um, we will be publishing her report on Moz Mozambique separately. Um, uh, our colleague Lidet Tadese is an expert on the on um, the Horn of Africa and has uh, considerable experience working in the Horn as well. Um, and I work together with a, with a, quite a young researcher in Mali, Uri Kamisoko, who um, who also was able to share her experiences working with you know working with feminist organisations in Mali and. Of, of, of the implementation of projects there. So it's something that at ECDBM, we are trying also to, to, to work together with local experts and to understand um, the perspectives. Um, although this report in the end does end up looking quite a lot at the, at the EU side of things um, because it's quite a technical subject, um, but, but it's certainly a very good point and one that we also um, do take on board. Um, I also think that um, in our report we, we touch quite a lot on um, on the, the 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 importance of working yes with uh, local civil society but also with local experts um, because clearly there is um, a, a whole a lot of expertise there that isn't necessarily present in in um, in delegations and in embassies where people are on shorter term contracts. The problem is that sometimes when, when people are brought in for consultancies, these can be short term. Um, and thus, when the consultancy is over, that knowledge is lost. So that's something that has to be also reckoned with in terms of, of how, how um, delegations and embassies work with, with experts. Great, thank you, uh, Chloe. Um, we have one more question, one more uh, participant who would like to take the floor. Mariana, uh, Mariana Fula, would you, you can open your camera, unmute yourself and pose your question directly to the panelists. The floor is yours. Okay, um, bonjour tout le monde. Let, let me speak in French. I'm may, maybe the only one speaking in French. And I would like to thank, uh, je voulais vous remercier de cette opportunité de pour, pour pouvoir participer à cette session. Et comme uh, l'a dit uh, l'une des présentatrices, uh, l'une, uh, oui, il faut tenir compte du contexte du pays. Parce que l'une des difficultés que nous rencontrons dans la mise en œuvre du Spotlight, vous savez, le Spotlight Initiative, en fait, c'est le partenariat de deux institutions, que ce soit l'Union européenne et les Nations unies. C'est deux entités complètement différentes. Et quand vous prenez, euh, il faut qu'on apprenne à se connaître et tout et tout, mais au niveau local, euh, Lorsqu'on a élaboré le programme, on n'a pas, le, globalement même parlant du Spotlight, on n'a pas tenu compte des réalités spécifiques de chaque pays. On a simplement parlé, il euh, y a les termes, euh, par exemple en Afrique, c'était l'élimination des violences faites aux femmes aux filles, euh, les pratiques néfastes. Mais vous savez, quand vous avez un pays euh, tel que le Mali, qui a son propre contexte, je pense qu'il est nécessaire d'en tenir compte dans dans l'élaboration du programme et même dans les relations entre la DUE et le système des Nations Unies. Parce qu'au finish, euh, on, nous sommes évalués sur les résultats que nous aurions délivrés sur le terrain, que nous aurions acquis sur le terrain. Et des fois, ce n'est pas facile, euh, par exemple, qu'on prend le changement des normes sociales. Le changement des normes sociales, ça prend du temps. On, ce n'est pas, par, par exemple, Spotlight, c'est quatre ans. Vous ne pouvez pas dire qu'en quatre ans, euh, c'est une hypothèse qu un, que, que la mentalité des gens peut changer sur certaines questions. Donc, il faudrait que vraiment que ce point soit pris en considération, pas seulement pour le Mali, mais pour chaque pays. Parce que le contexte, euh, d'abord, on, on vit dans un contexte sociopolitique, euh, l'instabilité, il y a cela, la crise multidimensionnelle. Mais il faut qu'on tienne compte de cela. Et le Mali, comme l'a dit euh, la présentatrice, c'est l'un des pays euh, où le conservatisme est vraiment 
très, très fort et l'influence croissante de jour en jour des, des religieux. Vous voyez, euh, il y a quelques mois, euh, l'avant-projet de loi qui, depuis 2017, qui se trouve dans les miroirs, a essayé, on a essayé de... Euh, C'était lors d'un atelier, on a essayé de débattre, de dire ce que, ce que cette loi pourrait apporter à la femme. Et cela a été interprété autrement. Le shérif de Nuro, qui a pris euh, qui, complètement une décision très, très négative à l'égard de la ministre d'antan qui était là, Mme Bintou Samake, euh, qu'il fallait la limoger du gouvernement et puis qui ne soutenait même plus le gouvernement. Et à, au finish, le gouvernement est obligé de se désodaliser. Bon, comment dirais-je? Oh, my goodness. En fait, vous voyez l'impact, en fait, de, 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 de le jar. Et quand vous prenez la, le concept jar, il faut que cela soit vraiment expliqué à toutes les parties prenantes, que ce soit le gouvernement, pour qu'ils soient tous, qu'on soit tous au, euh, autour de la même table, qu'on ait le même niveau d'information. Par mmh. exemple, euh, quand le gap de, de le gap de l'Union européenne, il est nécessaire, moi je pense, il est nécessaire, pas seulement parce que j'interviens dans le cadre du spotlight, mais il serait très très opportun pour qu'on sache, pour qu'il y ait plus de visibilité sur, sur, sur ce programme. Il est très très important qu'on en tienne compte. Oui. Parce que ça a été, moi on a été consulté, c'est parce qu'il y a Spotlight Initiative. Mm. Mais est-ce que les autres agences qui interviennent dans le domaine euh, des VB, dans le domaine du char au Mali, à savoir l'UNFP, l'UNICEF, l'UN Women, ont été abordées, ont été consultées, je ne saurais vous le dire. Mais c'est un concept qu'il faut vraiment, euh, s'il faut une formation, je ne sais pas si c'est la délégation de la DEU du Mali, qu'il faut qu'ils pensent à le faire comme ils ont fait sur la politique, euh, sur leur communication, leur plan oui. de communication. Donc c'est très, très important de communiquer sur Merci. ce programme qui est oui. très, très important. Bon, je ne vais pas monopoliser la parole, mais je tenais quand même à partager ce point de vue et je pense que c'était tout. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Marianne, uh, pour votre intervention. Um, I I'll quickly translate just to make sure that everyone has uh, gotten the, the same information. So Marianne wanted to highlight the importance of the local context uh, that uh, this has been uh, this was something that was um, tried and adapted or adopted in the uh, context of the Spotlight Initiative, which is, of course, a partnership between the EU, uh, UN and the EU. Um, but that in her uh, perspective, this was not always done to the level that was sufficient. And uh, she noted that it's a very important aspect to localize uh, interventions. Uh, it's not an easy one, but it's an important one. Also um, noting that uh, efforts to change or engage with norms will take a very long time. And she posed the question whether the Spotlight Initiative, which is four years, uh, will be sufficient to do that. Uh, she doesn't expect that norms can change uh, that fast and that longer term engagement is really key. Uh, also to engage other actors in the UN system and beyond the UN system, uh, not just in the Spotlight Initiative, but also wider uh, policy reforms. And she mentioned one instance where, you know, uh, attempts were made uh, at reforms, but that uh, there was a growing pushback, also referring to the, the growing role of conservative religious leaders in the case of Mali, which might be something that, that, that also happens, uh, is happening in other countries. So um, those were some of the points that uh, Marianne wanted to, to bring in. And, and merci beaucoup, Marianne, pour votre intervention. Um, unfortunately, I, we've run out of time. There were two other comments at the very beginning, uh, Virginia, about the trainings and whether they were publicly available or whether there were any links that you could share to the trainings that were uh, done on, the, on gender within the EU or any platforms. Um, perhaps uh, that is something that participants can uh, write to you about bilaterally, or if you have anything that you can share in the chat now, uh, please do. Um, I will ask Chloe if you have any closing remarks before we end the event, unfortunately, uh, for today. Um, Chloe? Um, no, I'd just like to thank everybody and also, yes, to say that 
um, we will be doing follow up research um, and thus we would welcome any emails or comments on uh, on the first study or on uh, potentially interesting areas for further study um, in the future, as we do hope to continue to engage on gender over the coming years. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chloe. And a, a big thank you as well to our speakers, uh, Virginia, Isabel and Vincent, uh, for your time and the participants as well to, to attend the webinar today. We hope to engage with you further and um, don't hesitate to reach out to us or the speakers today about uh, anything that concerns the implementation of GAP3 um, at the moment, but also in the future. Thank you very much and um, have a lovely afternoon. Thanks. Thanks a lot to everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Virginia. Thank you so much. Merci, Marianne. De rien. Un plaisir. <laughs>